Hello, everybody. Once again, we're back. NBC Sports Bay Area with Race in America, a candid conversation. My name is Monty Poole. My esteemed colleague, Logan Murdoch, is with me. And we have a, a three-man panelist today, all baseball. It's all baseball. Baseball is coming back. So we've got uh, actually three really uh, fine men that have been in the game and are making their way. And we got, we'll start with Dave Stewart. Stu, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Okay. And uh, Edwin Jackson also will be joining us. Edwin, say hello. What's going on, man? How you doing, man? I appreciate it. All right. It. Nice to meet you, man. And also, Jalen Davis. Jalen, say hello to the people. Hey, how you doing? All right. Now, the first thing I want to start with is give you guys a chance to, like, give us what your journey was like to this point. In other words, where did you start from childhood and to get to the uh, major leagues? And I want to start with you, Jalen, because <clears> – <throat> I feel like yours is going to be the shortest <laughs> because you're the youngest, man. Just turned 26. So tell us how you went from, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, wanting to be a ball player to where you got to now. Yeah, um, I actually was playing basketball and baseball growing up. And I don't know, there's something about baseball. I just like competing against guys and stuff like that. And it got to a point where I got to high school, I was like, oh, I might have a chance to go play at the next level. And um, I ended up going to college. I went to Appalachian State. I was there for three years and I got drafted by the Twins and uh 15 and then um this past well last year i got uh traded to the giants and i got called up in september so. now edwin you came along a little earlier than Jalen did uh, a few years earlier you might say edwin give us i know you were born overseas been around the baseball the major league base now for about what 18 years now uh tell us kind of where you started and how you got to where you are now um uh. Being born in Germany, when I came back from Germany in 1991, football was actually the first sport that I was uh, that I played um, organized ball with. Um, then kind of went to basketball, then baseball. So baseball was actually the last sport that I played. And uh, I say growing up until eighth grade, I played all three sports. Um, then it, then it went to baseball and football. Once I got to high school, I wasn't very big, so I played football my freshman year, football and baseball, and then. Uh, just transitioned to baseball after my freshman year and continue with that. Um, wasn't a high prospect, wasn't a big, big scout, I mean, highly scouted guy. Um, I was seen from a couple of my teammates, Nick Long and Steven Register, being scouted, and I kind of just made myself shine. And I um, ended up signing with UAB, but never went there because I ended up getting drafted sixth round by the Dodgers and ended up making my major league debut in 2003 um, against Arizona against Randy Johnson. And from there, it's been a roller coaster. We still here, though. <laughs> yeah. Keep at it, man. Keep at it. Keep at it. Stu, uh, I know yours is different because, um, you know, you've been around. You've, you've been a ball player. You've been front office guy. You've been an agent. You've been a little bit of everything in this game. But take us back to when your childhood when you decided you wanted to play baseball because I know for a fact that your, your childhood was different from those of Edwin and Jalen in the sense that baseball in the 60s and 70s and even early 80s, you know, there were a lot of African-Americans playing the game. And we've seen those numbers decline over the last 30 or so years. So go back to your childhood and what led you to become a baseball player. Baseball was brought to me initially by uh, my father. Uh, my dad was a huge, huge, huge baseball fan. Um, he was a longshoreman, worked for Pacific Maritime. Uh, he and my mother are from Louisiana. Um, they moved to California in 1947. Um, and he brought me to my first baseball game in 1962. Um, it was a Giants game against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, I saw the Pirates play, saw Roberto Clemente play. Um, we were Giants fans. Um, and if you were a Giants fan, then you were a Willie Mays fan. And so um, I had an opportunity to see Willie Mays, Jim Ray Hart, Juan Marinchel, and the Alou brothers, Matty Jesus and Philippe Alou, and Willie McCovey. Gaylord Perry. So my first game uh, was in 62. Um, we waited after the game to see Willie Mays. Um, and back in those days, you waited and you waited, you waited and you waited. And there had to be probably a thousand people out there all waiting on Willie. Um, we were at the very, very back. It was bat day. Finally, some two and a half hours later, uh, Willie Mays got to us. And I got uh, my glove signed. And um, that made an impression on me at that time as a five, six-year-old kid. 
Um, and so that became my first experience with baseball. Then my brother, who's five years older than me, we played in the backyard all the time. Um, for us, a baseball was aluminum foil rolled up with, uh, with tape. And uh, we played in the backyard. We played a game of strikeout. It seemed like I was always the guy on the other side pitching, and everybody I pitched against was the Giants lineup. And uh, that became my next experience. And then in 68, the uh, Oakland A's came to town. And uh, my father by then uh, was getting older and working more and couldn't really take me to games. And so I started going out. And then Reggie Jackson was the next person that I, I got an opportunity to meet and who made an impression on me, a positive impression on me. Um, leaving baseball tickets for me. We used to hop the fence and hide out in right field. And um, he started out leaving us tickets, and uh, we became close that way. And, you know, I was a three-sport athlete, football, basketball, and baseball. I had uh, 30 football scholarships. Um, but um, when I graduated from high school at 5'9", 190, uh, I didn't think that football was going to be the way I wanted to go. The Dodgers signed me. And I ended up uh, playing for the Dodgers. And then, you know, going forward, uh, I had Reggie Smith and Davey Lopes, um, Dusty Baker. Um, those guys all took me under their wing uh, as a rookie and brought me everywhere, brought my first suit. Um, and Dusty introduced me to Hank Aaron um, when we went to Atlanta. And that, was, that made an impression on me. Reggie introduced me to Bob Gibson as a rookie, and that made an impression on me, and I've been in love with baseball ever since. I, I want to I start with Stu with this question. What has it been like for, you know, you seeing the evolution of baseball where, as Monty said, there, is a, there was a lot of black players to look up to when you were growing up, and to see it now where um, the percentage of black ball players has changed and it has gone down, how has that been for you to see um, representation go down for black players in the game? It's kind of crazy because when I think back to 1981, which was my rookie year, but my first call it was in 78. And just to think about my Dodger teams, just black players. We had Reggie Smith, Davey Lopes, Daryl Thomas, myself. Oh, God. Um, did I say Dusty? Dusty, Dusty Baker. We had uh, – Al Downing, <clears throat> you know, on our pitching staff. And so, you know, right there, and I, I probably forgot somebody, but that's seven or eight black players on a team right right there. And then in 81, it was, it was similar. Um, and as, you know, we've gotten into the game um, to watch the numbers diminish, you know, one would try to make you think that, there aren't that many black players out there that want to still play the game versus making the game available to black players. And instead of that bubble guy being that bubble, that 25th guy, which is between a black player and a white player and the white player gets the job. Um, that that's the, the, the issue and the problem that I have uh, with the game of baseball is that there are some real talented 24th and 25th black players out there that aren't getting the jobs. And I, I think that the game needs to be adjusted in that way. I mean, the superstar players in the, in the game, the black superstar players, we all know who they are. Um, but in championship season and championship teams, your role players play as big a role as the superstar players. And so that 24th, 23rd, 21st, those, those guys are just as valuable. And I'm having a real hard time believing that we don't have black players that can fill those roles and do the job as well. And in my opinion, probably do it better. Um, and th that's where I think the, the game is suffering. Those jobs aren't going to those players. And I, I do want to get to Jalen on this one, on this next question. You wrote a post on Medium talking about your experiences with racism in baseball, particularly when I think you were in high school and, um, you got called the N word uh, during a game. How have you experienced that, and what's it like to experience racism 
in a sport that you love and you want to play, one, you're not getting represented that much. And when um, you do play, you know, racism is persistent around you. How was that growing up in, into that? Um, it's kind of hard. I mean, when it happened, it kind of shocked me, to be honest. I mean, I was in high school. I graduated high school in 2012. And I was like thinking like this, this is still going on. And then when I got to college, too, it happened again. So it's just like, to me, it was just shocking that that's still going on. And I mean, for me, like I've always been like maybe it's one or two black guys on my team. So having to deal with it, kind of deal with it by myself was definitely kind of hard, too. And I think there's there's another another thing I do want to point to. We, we're all here. I think the, the one big reason why this show exists is because um, the killing of George Floyd and what that has done uh, throughout the world and how we've responded to it. Major League Baseball, though, was the last uh, was the last sport to uh, comment on uh, George Floyd and comment on and, and condemning racism. Uh, I want to start with Edwin on this one. How did you feel when you saw that? MLB was not taking a stand, and it was the last uh, lead to take a stand. How did that make you feel? The initial thought is, um, do we do we have their support? Does MLB have our back on this on this cause? Um, the amount of black players that we have in MLB that play the game of baseball, and MLB not coming up for it and making a comment earlier. Um, when an incident happens, it kind of makes you t- step back and take a take a deep thought about like, is it a correlation to the amount of black, black players in the game and and they'll be not speaking up for the cause when you see all the other sports um, from basketball, um, football, hockey. Um, obviously, you know basketball and football is um, you know majority African Americans, but um, to even have hockey speak up before baseball it's like man okay it's, it's all it almost feels like a slap in the face from MLB um not speaking up sooner and from players having to press the issue and, and get on MLB to say something about the cause um, I feel like we as players should not have to press MLB to speak up on the cause MLB should be willing to speak up on its own to let the black players know that you know, we have their support on this cause and we have their support about being um, black in America and black in a game where we are the minority. So, um, what did you think when you first heard or saw uh, the video maybe uh, of the George Floyd uh, killing? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's funny, man, because, um, you know, historically, I, I go back a long way. Um, and I grew up in East Oakland, 73rd and East 14th is, was the um, headquarters of the Black Panthers. Um, on 66th and East 14th was the first Muslim mosque uh, that was opened by Malcolm X. Um, the Symbionese Liberation Army uh, was there at that time. And so, you know, I growing up in East Oakland and having that background in history with, with, those groups that stood for black rights. Um, my first thought was, what, you know, because I remember Rodney King, and and those police officers were 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 found out guilty, and then, you know, then we've had a chain of one killing after another killing after another killing after another killing. And so my first thought was, shoot, they beat Rodney, Rodney King to death, or damn near death. And so did they get off because he lived? But then you have to negate that because there have been murders, you know, and police officers have gotten away. Um, and so in this particular case, when I saw it, I was thinking, my first thought was, what in the hell is he doing? My second thought is, why are your partners just standing there watching this happen? And, I mean, when I was looking at him, it was like, this guy is just casually killing this man, casually. Knee in his neck, hands on his hip. Um, he didn't look like he was concerned that anything would happen to him at the time that, the, that this was taking place. And then eventually his death. And so, I mean... For me, I thought, 
he doesn't think that anything's going to happen to him because that's why he's doing it. And it showed in his demeanor and his appearance that he felt that what he was doing was perfectly fine and it was okay. And there was, though there would have been probably an investigation in his mind, he probably thought, I'll be investigated and this thing will all go away. And, and then my next thought, quite frankly, was the president that we have has incited this kind of activity in America. That was my next thought. And then my next thought is, I hope that this guy rots in jail. I think that's where he's going to go. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um, when, you, when you look around at uh, baseball and compare it to basketball and to football in particular, um, baseball is, we, as we all know, of a, the, the three, it's America's most conservative major sport. Now, uh, we've seen Colin Kaepernick kneel uh, for the national anthem, protesting police brutality and injustice. Um, only one guy in baseball that I know of, and that's Bruce Maxwell, who was a member of the A's, that actually kneeled for the national anthem for the very same reasons, you know, police brutality and injustice. Stu, why wouldn't you see few more players black or white, take up this cause in baseball? Well, because in my opinion, baseball is the one sport that has somehow resisted change. Um, you've got one black general manager, one black uh, chief officer in Kenny Williams, and one black general manager in Mike Hill. Um, you've got two black managers. When you look through the, the, the way that the office management is set up in baseball, um, Theo Epstein said it best that they're hiring people that look like them and that they feel comfortable with. And so in baseball, for as long as you can remember, Kurt Flood um, brought up free agency. And when he brought about free agency, he was banned from the game because it was against the establishment. And, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but if you walk – if you walk an elephant, one of the strongest animals in the world, if you walk an elephant, an elephant stake whose leg is chained to a stake and you walk him in a circle for a year, four years, five years, and you finally take that chain off, then you have that elephant thinking that he can't get outside of the area that he's walked in, and he probably won't walk outside of that area. But what baseball has done is it's conditioned, in my opinion, the black players that are in the game to think that this is the way you have to do things. And if you step outside of this, then you're not going to have a job in the game. And so I think that what took place in the case of Bruce Baxwell is that a lot of the players thought, you know, I'm comfortable, I'm making good money, I don't want to buck the system, I don't want to put myself in a position that you know, I can't play this game and I can't continue to support my family. And I, I think that that, quite frankly, is what took place and what happened. And the game has conditioned players to think in that way, black players to think in that way. I've seen black players in this game do some things that a lot of white players have done. And the black player serves and, and it serves a different circumstance than the white player. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example. Roger Clemens in the playoffs gets a broken bat that's, that's hit back to him. He throws the bat at Piazza running up the first baseline. Had a black player done that, he would have been kicked out of the game and probably suspended. Roger Clemens served no – there was no – there was nothing that took place to him. He served no time. He wasn't suspended for anything. He basically got a slap on the hand, and I heard one broadcaster say that he was, he was so intense that he thought that the bat was a ball. Well, get out of here. That's a bunch of goddamn garbage. And so I, I just think that the conditions that black players play under today, we always have something in the back of our mind that says that if I do something that is out of the system, if I say something that is out of the system, then I'm going to lose my job. And I'm going to lose the ability to, to play this game. And I'm going to lose the ability to have the earnings to take care of my family and my family's family. Because we're at a point now in this game where 
two or three good contracts and you, you make a legacy for your whole family. And so I think that that's what took place with Bruce. This sport has not been tolerant of change. It's not been tolerant of militancy or freedom of speech or a black man saying what he, what he thinks. Those things have been punished by being blackballed from the game. Edwin, um, what's your experience been like? You came along a few years later than Stu, obviously, um, and, and are still in the game. You're a free agent right now. But what's your experience been like on that end in terms of just, you know, being a black player in a sport that is so conservative? And what have you seen and experienced? I feel like um, I've definitely been in some positions where, like Stu said, um, being on a bubble, a bubble player where it's maybe myself and maybe a person of a white player and myself not getting a job because I'm black um, easily is for, I feel like for GMs with myself coming young, they can say, okay, we didn't want him to be a super two. Or we didn't want him to, uh, we felt like he needed to go work on something. Uh, I've been in the office before where I've, I've been told that I needed to go back to work on my slider. And I'm like, my slider, I'm like, that's what I came up on a fastball slider. Had you told me I need to go work on a changeup or something, then at least it would have been not as so a slap in the face. I'm like, you tell me I need to go work on the slider, and that's my that's almost a better pitch for me than my fastball. It was clear and evident why I'm going back, you know, to AAA when um, the player that I was I was up against has pitched on the backfield, hasn't pitched in the teams, and you know I feel like he was given a job. Um, I've had hate mail. Um, I've been called names. I haven't had anybody call me the N word, but I've been called a lot of names. It's, it's pretty much they they overshadowing it. They're kind of softening it up um, where it relates to you know me being black. Um, I haven't had to experience much um, from teammates. You know, I've had teammates where they're looking at me different ways, but you can kind of feel a little little tenseness between them you can feel something isn't right but it hasn't just been blatant but i definitely feel like through all my transactions i have dealt with some transactions that have been done because of my color and maybe because a white player is getting a, an opportunity um that i'm not getting where you want to take care of your own you know you, you rather take care of the person that looks like you um than take care of the person who really don't earn the job Jalen, um, for you, obviously being younger, um, do you feel like you have to be better than most guys to just to have a job? I mean, what, what's your feeling in terms of what it takes for you to maintain a roster spot? I mean, yeah, I mean, I've felt like that ever since I've stepped into the game. I mean, because it's really not, you look around, you don't see anybody else that looks like you, so you automatically feel like that. So I definitely feel like, yeah, I mean, it is like we have to work harder, for sure. Is it hard to – how do I put this? Is it hard to wear your blackness in baseball? I mean, yeah, I get – sometimes you – you can't really – I feel like you can't really be yourself, you know? You try to, like, just be this model that they set, and you have to go by it. Sue a good point about this uh, earlier, about um, how the game has stifled a voice and stifled um, how you express yourself as a black player. I want to pose this question to Jalen. You talked about um, in your Medium post how you were nervous to put it out. You were nervous to um, speak out on these things. What went through your mind just before you even speak out about your experience? Um, just by me being a young guy. I mean, I, I don't have barely any show time. And um, just thinking about if I do this, is this going to hurt my career? Hmm. Uh, that was the biggest thing for me, and uh, so I just picked up the phone and called one of our coaches, Antoine, our first base coach, and I was like, hey, like, look, like, I want to do this, but at the same time, I'm like, is, is this going to hurt me? And he was just like, hey, look, he said, do whatever you feel. He said, if you feel right by it and you feel like you should do it, do it. He said, nobody's going to look at you as being a young guy that's going to look at you as being a, a baseball player. So, I mean, by having that from him and talking to him about that, that kind of helped me to go ahead and, like, put it out there. How did it feel that the uh, Giants put it on their platform? Um, it made me feel good. It made me feel like they had my back. And it really helped a lot, for sure. I'll give you, I'll give you an example, um, a prime example. Ricky Henderson, one of the, in my opinion, top five players in, ever to play the game. 
Ricky played with style, you know, and because of some of his antics, people called him a hot dog and there's no no place for him to play like that in this game or you can't do this or you can't do that in the game. I mean, we go back to the Negro Leagues. When you look at Negro League baseball, they've always played with flair and style and they've been showmen in the game. And that style of play, up until recently, now you see more white players doing it with the flip of the bat and, and you know, the, the walk-offs and the slow trots around the bases. Up until now, that type of flair was not acceptable in baseball. It was always frowned on, but the majority of players that did it were black players. So, I mean, the game, the game looks at black players – in, in, in a totally different way than they do the white players. And for that matter, I think even the Hispanic players at this point, um, obviously we're the lowest percentage. And so um, I just don't think that, I don't think that black players, unless you're a superstar type player, um, I, I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a battle every year. It's a battle every year to make a team. It's a battle every year. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's not made an easy, it's not an easy road. I mean, like you said, Steve, the list goes on about things that we see white players do that as a black player, you sit back and you're like, had I done that, my career would have been over. Had, had I done this, had I done what this dude done, I would be out the game. I guarantee you my narrative, my narrative wouldn't be the same way in this report if had it been me. Um, we, we sit back and we do that a lot, and it's frustrating that we have to, to sit there and witness those things and, you know, feel like we don't have a fair shot or we don't have the equality that we deserve in the game. Um, it's frustrating to sit back and not be able to speak your mind about a fact of, of being black and American because how it might affect our job when everyone else has the freedom of speech to just go and speak their mind however they want to. Um, but if we say it, then it's coming from a bad place, it's frowned upon. Um, that, that's the part of the game that, that makes you sit back and it gets you pissed off that you can't speak your mind and it's just coming from the heart. Race in America, a candid conversation, will be back after these messages. On the same vein, um, Ian Desmond of the Rockies recently um, said that he was not going to play baseball this year for a couple reasons. One being the pandemic, obviously COVID-19, but the other being um, the civil rights movement resurgence, the protest that he's seeing. And, you know, as a man, Ian, I think is biracial. He is saying that, you know what, this is a time to be aware, to be enlightened, to take action. He needs time to deal with this. And it's a priority for him as opposed to playing baseball if, when, the, when the games come back. When you see a player like that, an active player, secure in his spot, come out and write about this and talk about his decision not to play, and part, part of it is based on the racial treatment he has gotten, what he has seen, what he has witnessed, and what he has, up to this point, suppressed. Just said, you know what, I'm just going to ignore it. And now he's saying, I can't ignore it anymore. When you see that, how do you feel about something like that, Edwin? Um, it's, it's encouraging, that. That's, that's empowering for me to see that. And I know Ian very well, and I spoke to him about that. Um, that's something that we'd love to see. That's something that is sad that we had to suppress those feelings for so long from being afraid to speak up. Um, and for him to be able to speak up now and, and not be afraid anymore, um, I love to see that. You know, um, I love to see that, and I wish we could have it for more people. Um, it's brave. It takes a lot to do um, to, to express your feelings to the world uh, about how you feel. It, it takes a lot to do that. And, you know, Ian is one of those people where he's had enough. You know, enough is enough. And he, he wants to express himself. Um, it shows it show you his values, like what he values and the order that he has his values in. Um, his family comes before the game. His life comes before the game. Um, you know, it shows that he's put a lot of his emotions on the back burner because of baseball. And now he, he's tired of it. He's, he's switching the roles and, you know, he's putting his family first and he's putting himself first beyond the sport that he played. 
Stu, did you see what Ian wrote? I mean, if you hadn't, even if you didn't, I mean, <clears> that's, <throat> that's the gist I, of it. And what did you think when you saw it then? I said, man, this brother stepped up. <laughs> it's the first thing I thought of me. He stepped up. He stepped up big. He had things that obviously had been bothering him for a, a long period of time. <clears throat> And he voiced the things that were bothering him. He, uh, he voiced the things that he felt needed to be addressed in baseball. But he also um, made baseball aware and the world, aware, the world aware that, if I read it right, he's got a baby on the way. He's got children at home. And, hey, I'd much rather be safe spending my time with my family and teaching these kids how to play the game. And in the meantime, baseball – Handle your business is the way I took care of it. The, the way I looked at it is baseball, handle your business. And I'm going to handle my business right here at home. But you got some issues that you need to take care of. That's the way I looked at it. And, and quite frankly, um, Edwin and, and the group of black players that, that performed the video, that put on the video um, uh, about Black Lives Matter, I thought that I was encouraged by that because – I think the game today, from when I came up in the game, when I first came up in the game in the, in the mid, mid-70s mid and then on into the 80, early 80s, black players from every team communicated with each other. If I went from one town to the next town, I, I, was, I was in touch with them, brothers. They came to my town. I was in touch with the brothers. Off season, we communicated, and, and some great friendships um, were, were formed then. And I learned that, like I said, through Dusty and Reggie and Davey. And I'm because there are so few players, and because the jobs are so so scarce for us, it almost feels now. And I can say this, and I could be wrong, Edwin. You guys are in the game now, but it look it appears to me now being an executive, a minor league director, that because the jobs are so scarce for us that we're not doing a good job of networking amongst ourselves. And, and to me, that's an issue and a problem. It, it's an issue and a problem. When I was coming up, one of my teammates or one of the guys in the league could call me from anywhere and say, hey, Stu, Man, what you got? I'm in, I'm in Cincinnati, man. I can't find nothing to do. What you got? And, you know, hey, man, shoot, I know some people there. Hey, man, I'm going to hook you up with these people. We're going to go by the house and have some food. We're going to get out and go, go have a meal, go clubbing, whatever the case. These my people, they're going to treat you like me. Boom. And I don't know that we're doing enough of that in this day and time amongst black players in the league. And Jalen and Edwin, what have you guys seen? Uh, how have you guys seen this from your vantage point when it comes to protesting and things like that? And are you encouraged by what you have seen? I would say I am. Um, man, I, I actually, I went out and, and I personally protest, um, and it was powerful. Um, for me, I've never done anything like that. Um, I've seen protests on TV, especially coming from Oakland. Um, they're like, they are the trendsetters of protests. You know, um, you hear protests, everybody all night like reverts back to open because I don't think anyone protests like open. Um, they, they have been known to, to make some noise and make themselves heard. But it's been amazing to see, like, students of all races, all ethnicities, um, kids, parents, um, the elderly, the youth, all come together and fighting for one cause because that's what it's going to take. Um, we can... We can have all the black people we want together fighting for this change, but it's going to take other races to get involved in order for things to change. And that's just the way it is. And to see someone of another race out there screaming loud and, and, you know, fighting for equality, I just thought, why should it not be? You know, why should it not be? If this guy is out here, he's not even black. He don't even have to deal with the things I have to deal with. And they are out there marching and screaming and protesting. And I felt like I owed it to myself and my family and my kids who hopefully they will see the change. I owe it to them to be out there on the forefront and um, voicing, using my voice to help make a change. You know, it's one of the, we took our kids as well um, for a kids protest in Arizona. They had a kids protest. And, you know, my wife and I, we sat back contemplating it because it's a pandemic, um, it's a virus. We didn't know if they were going to want to wear the masks. But 
we felt like this opportunity, we had to let them go experience that. And to my surprise, I heard zero complaints about the walking, zero complaints about the masks. Um, they had their signs, they were cheering. Um, they were, I mean, my daughter and my son, they were into it, like super into it. And as a, as a parent, that makes you proud to see your kids into it and asking questions, um, curious to what's going on, wanting to know because this is who it's going to affect. You know, hopefully when they grow up, they'll be able to say, we were at that protest helping making a change for us. And um, I, I feel like it's something that I'm super glad that we took them out there to be able to experience that and enlighten them on what's going on in the world because let's be real, the life they live is not reality. Like these, the baseball kids live and athletes, the kids of um, professional athletes, it's not reality. This is a dream world they live in. Um, the things they get to have, the houses they get to live in, the places they get to go, the way they get to travel, that is not the way of the world. Um, they're in a small percentage of people that get to live like that. And I feel like for me, being a, a guy from the South, it's imperative for me to keep my kids grounded because I'm a humble person. Um, what I have is a job, I'm blessed. And I feel like I'm blessed with everything I have to be able to give back and to provide for those who don't have. And Jalen, how has it been for you to see um, these protests? And um, It's been empowering for sure. Uh, I have a 13 year old brother. So with me being gone all the time, I definitely worry about him with all this stuff going on. But uh, just trying to explain to him, like so he's never had to like really like witness anything. And I'm uh, just trying to explain to him what's going on and stuff like that. It really helps by like with, with everything going on, just showing them, like just like talking to them about it and being able to see people come together of different races and stuff like that. It really helps like, cause having, trying to have that conversation with him, he still doesn't really like understand cause he's never had to witness it. So I feel like that helps out a lot. And, and Edwin, I, I do want to get back to you with this question. You brought up a, a point about you know, having kids and bringing them out to these protests. What's it like? raising a black kid in this day and age for you? Oh, it's tough. It's tough when you have to explain to your son that people are going to judge him before he even opens his mouth. Uh, people are going to judge him by the way he looks, by the way he dresses, um, by the way he talks. Um, people will judge him by the color of his hair. Um, to have your daughter come home and, and out in Arizona, we are a small percentage of blacks to come home and say, why isn't my hair blonde? Why is my skin a different color? Um, it's one of those things that rubs you the wrong way, especially for me being a military brat. I grew up with everything. I grew up in a melting pot. So to sit down and explain to them America, the real America, and not how they live, um, it's tough because they don't really get a grasp of it. They kind of understand, but they, a lot of it they don't really understand. Like, why do I have to do special things if I get pulled over? Why are you telling me these things about, you know, somebody may look at me and not like it because of my color? Um, it's imperative, though, but it, it's sad that we still have to have these conversations that my father had as a kid, though. You know, it's, it's sad that we still have to have generational um, conversations to our kids about conversations that their parents had or their grandparents had with our parents, you know. Um, uh, we, everybody has to be tired of giving the same speeches and to hear people not understand, well, I have to tell my son to be careful with the police as well. It's different when you're black. It's different because, like you say, you're already getting judged before you even, the, the cop even come to the car. It's already judgment as soon as you're black. So they're already coming up with, you know, a predetermined judgment on you. And not to teach a kid not to move so swiftly and not be you know, not the um, not show any kind of um, sudden movements. It's, it's tough, man. It's tough. I want to bring it back to, to baseball to a degree um, and, and start with, with Jalen. Jalen, um, you know, like when Stu and me grow, growing up and, you know, maybe Edwin too, but um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would see black kids on playgrounds playing baseball in every major city. And we, you don't see that like you used to see it. Some of them are playing basketball. Some of them are playing football. But when I grew up, I played all of them, you know. But when the summer comes, a lot of baseball fields sit empty. And I'm wondering for a youngster like you, Jalen, um, was that your experience? I mean, did you, was it like that when you grew up? And how did you get involved in terms of 
uh, you have to have certain talent, obviously, but you also have to have certain opportunities to show what you can do when you're 13, 14 years old. How did it happen for you? Right. Um, well, I started out playing with a like, small community field like back home. And there was this team, the AU team that was going around, it was all black players. And I guess we played them one time, and the coach saw me. He's like, hey, I want you to come play for me. So I played for him from all the way to nine years old, all the way till I got to high school. And I feel like being with them, just being, that was the first time I've ever played with that many black kids. And I feel like he gave me that opportunity. And, it, and I, just being around all of them, it made me like love the game more. They're actually playing with people who look like me. So um, I think that's, that was the opportunity that I was given and that, that made me love the game more. For sure. Because you hear so much about uh, traveling teams and, you know, that co- these things cost money. Yeah. And a lot of kids don't have that. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do you catch up? Because that seems to be the path to, to the major leagues or to even pro ball at any level is to be part of a traveling team and then maybe get a college and, and go on from there. And I just at your age, man, you, you somehow found a team that was all black yeah. and it worked for you. Yeah, I mean, we were, if you look around, we were the only one. So it was kind of like going up and play against all these early guys, and they look at us like, you get looks for sure. I mean, because it's an all black team. And I mean, we were pretty good too. So, um, yeah, just giving the opportunity to play with them. And um, I don't know, it, it really, you don't see that anymore. I feel like, like you said, you don't see kids outside playing baseball. It's always either basketball or football. Stu? Going back to your childhood, obviously, we know what it was like, but why do you think there's been this, this change over the last 30, 40 years where, you know, you don't see as many black kids playing ball, just picking up a bat and a ball and a glove and going to play? I can tell you this. Um, when I was coming up, baseball was free. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that. It was free. All you had to do is jump in the back of the truck. I, we had a guy named Eddie Jewell. we jump in the back of the truck. And he'd take us to every ballpark. We, it was almost like it was young kids barnstorming when we was, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Baseball was free. Um, we had our coaches. We had our leagues. Um, we didn't have to pay for uniforms. You know, it was free. Um, we didn't – people asked me if I ever played travel ball. There was no such thing. And when I was growing up, uh, there was no travel ball. Um, it was just, it was, it was easier to play. Um, in my neighborhood, everybody played baseball. If we didn't go to the baseball field, you know, we'd take a brick and put newspaper down, make our bases, and we play in the streets. So it was, the sport was loved. I do believe that, I mean, every team, you, every team when you turned on the Pittsburgh Pirates, how many brothers was playing for the Pirates? So you turn on TV, you see the Pirates playing. You, see, you turn on the Giants, you see all the, all the black players on the Giants. The Mets had black players. The Dodgers had black players. Everybody had black players. It wasn't like there was a quota that needed to be filled and then you cut it off and no, you can't play anymore. So I think a lot of it has to do because people say, well, baseball is expensive. I think that's a small part of the equation. But I think the bigger part of the equation is I don't want to be in – it was – for me, it, the difficult thing about being at general managers' meetings is when I walked in the room, I felt like I was the only one in the room. Well, when you're watching baseball and you turn on the TV and they scan down the bench and you see two black players on a whole team, well, why would I be encouraged to play that game? The message is I don't want you involved in this. This game's not for you. So why would I want to play baseball when I don't even see me playing baseball? And I think that, in my opinion, that's the issue with the game is, one, you're not encouraging black players to play it by the message that you're sending to our neighborhood. And you brought up a good point with that and not seeing people that look like you. When do you think that that changed in in your mind, Stu? Bro, I mean, it's... It's all the way through. I mean, I can tell you this. In Oakland, black kids are still playing baseball. If you go to Greemansville on a Saturday and Sunday, you see black kids playing baseball or Bushrod. Black kids are playing baseball. But now, how many black kids 
per team in, in college. None coming through the college ranks. We have one or two per team, maybe. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you say when do I think it changed, it's really tough to say. Uh, quite frankly, when I found out what the numbers were, I was surprised. So I didn't even see the change, you know, because I was already, depending on where you're from, I guess is the best way to put it. Because like I said, I'm from Oakland. And the majority of my life I've spent in Oakland. And because I'm in Oakland and I'm seeing black kids playing baseball, I guess I was naive to think that it's like that everywhere. So I really didn't see the change. It. I was surprised by it. Kaylin, um, where does base, what, what can baseball, even sports, what can baseball do to make African Americans feel more welcome, more a part of things, uh, more included in where the sport is going? Um, I feel like it starts with the younger kids uh, doing something to get them involved with the game, whether it's like um, like an interleagues or something like that. Like, I mean, did, did we have something like that a while back? And it's RBI, just, yeah. yeah. So, like, I feel like they don't talk about that anymore. Um, just stuff like that, just trying to get kids into the game, I think that'll help out. Edwin? I think it definitely starts with the youth. Um, going back and getting back into the communities. I want to say the only program that baseball has is RBI program. And I know it doesn't cover a lot of the youth that um, that are in the world that play baseball. Um, I think also like Stu so we need to market black baseball players. Um, when you turn on TV, you're not seeing many black players on commercial. You look at basketball, they're marketing back black players. Uh, football markets black players. Um, I mean, Mookie Betts is an MVP, and you hardly see him on TV. And this is one of the best in the game, and you hardly see him when you turn on baseball commercials. We have to market our, like you said, when you're younger, you want to emulate who you see. Everybody wants to be Michael Jordan because we saw Michael Jordan. We saw him on TV. We saw him in commercials. We saw him on Space Jam. Um, if you don't see black players, how can you want to be someone you never see? You may hear about them, but you don't see it, especially in this world today with the amount of social media that we have. Um, people are not really watching TV anymore. People go turn and watch TV on their phone before they hardly turn on the TV. So um, I think for the youth, we have to get back to the youth. Um, I mean, the only black players you see in college probably are the HBCUs. And we probably, is not a lot of money being dumped in HBCU baseball. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how much is scouted. Uh, the last person that I've seen come from HBCU baseball is what, Ricky Weeks? And I'm sure there are a lot more Ricky Weeks out there that aren't being looked at or just being overlooked. Um, but it definitely starts in the community. We have to get kids when they're younger. And we have to start putting money into these baseball programs. Um, and that'll help, that'll help encourage them and give them hope that they can play baseball instead of going to football and basketball. What, what what do you think, Stu? Like, how do you get – we talked about maybe why uh, black players aren't in anymore, but what do you think will – it? what do you think it will take for um, black players to be able to get back into the ranks? Well, I, I do think that Major League Baseball did one thing right, but they deviated from it. Um, Major League Baseball with the Compton Academy, that was the first academy that they started, Um, And it was focused on Afro-American players. That was their main focus. They were trying to go out and get Afro-American players to play the game. And it worked for a while. Um, They had, they had, uh, they had number one picks coming out of the academy. um, And they were filtering players into professional baseball. Since then, it has deviated from its original plan, um, and it's, I guess you can't, you can't, you can't say only black players, um, but you're not seeing as many black players now going into the academies as they did when they first started, so I think it's lost its focus. It's not focused so much on getting black players involved in the game as it was, Um, but I think, similar to what Edwin said, we, we need to do a better job of marketing the sport. We need to do a better job of getting into the neighborhoods and encouraging our kids to play the sport. 
um, there need to be more programs similar to what the the youth academies were for Major League Baseball. There need to be there needs to be more of that. Um, and if you can do that, but I, I think that that our, our kids have a chance to be able to play this game. But I mean, everyone's right, man. Mookie Betts, one of the best players in the game. I never see him. We see we see Mike Trout, but shoot. Mookie Betts, I can't remember seeing him in any any commercials. I haven't seen him endorsed well by the sport. Um, and so, once again, that would lead you to believe that he's not really embraced by the sport. One last question before we close out, and I want to start with you, Jalen. Um, where with, with the NBA, uh, they've already been given permission that players can wear uh, social messages on their jerseys. Uh, there will be black, they're expected to be Black Lives Matter signs or somewhat of uh, acknowledgement in the NBA. And even in the NFL, they're talking about, they're anticipating guys will protest. Uh, guys will have a, a peaceful protest during the anthem or some form of acknowledging where the world is right now. Baseball, I guess, what, would base, what, what can baseball do that would make you feel comfortable making a statement or what would you like to see done by baseball, and not just by black ball players, but by all players? I don't know. That's a hard question. I mean, honestly, I don't really see them doing anything, to be honest, because, I mean, it took them that long to announce the problem, like, and the videos and stuff with football and basketball already did it. So um, I honestly don't know if they will do anything, to be honest. What would you like to see? Um... I don't know. Maybe I mean I guess basketball is doing the jerseys. They're doing like the names on that. At least like we like a patch or something. I mean something small. I mean something small. But um, I think we talked about EJ like doing like something with like the anthem or something like that. Uh, maybe like playing Martin Luther King speech and stuff like that. So I think the biggest thing would be um, backing whatever we come up that we want to do. That would be the biggest thing that baseball could do. Back us and what we prefer to do, um, however we prefer to uh, express ourselves, back us up. That's the best thing baseball can do. If whatever we decide we want to do, have our backs with it. Stu, as someone who played the game, was in the front office, also been an agent, what would you like to see baseball do at this point in America's history? Well, what I know, well, what would I like to see baseball do? I'd like to see them encourage majority black ownership first of all um i think that that's a major need um and you know cap off to jeter cap off to magic but they're not majority owners they're small owners in in, in, in a baseball team i want to see 51 percent black ownership in a baseball team that in itself would be historic for baseball it would also be an example for every other major sports franchise um, and so I think that, first of all, and I think Ian Desmond said that, he'd like to see black ownership, real ownership. Um, and then, um, and then uh, the second thing, the second thing, and the second thing is paramount as the first, is ownership in baseball, they need to, on a regular basis, put themselves in situations where they are with people of color often, whether it's once a week, once a month, whatever the case may be for you to understand people, you have to be around them. You have to get to know them. And the reason I think that ownership sits in their perch and they look down on people and, and for you to really understand your neighborhood, you got to get outside your goddamn house and walk the block. I want to thank everybody, the panelists, Dave Stewart, Jalen Davis, Edwin Jackson, and my colleague, Logan Murdoch. I'm Monty Poole. This has been Race in America, a candid conversation. Mm -hmm.